It's going to warm up a little bit. Mm -hmm. so maybe my frostbite will go away. I know I heard somebody saying they were wearing a mask just to keep their face warm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully we'll be able to take our masks off here and warm up. And, and in about, being in Alabama in about a week, we'll be complaining how hot it is. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love it. People love it. <laughs> yeah. I was, I was, it's funny, in the summertime, Think, man, I can't wait till winter where it cools off a little bit. Oh. And then in the wintertime, man, I can't wait till summer will warm up a little. Yeah. I, guess, I guess just human nature is to be complainers. Never happy. <laughs> <laughs> Never happy. Uh, 
can, can, can you hear me at least a little bit on here? I know this, this microphone is not, yeah. it wiggles around a little bit. There, I can hear you. Okay. Well, I'll make sure I, uh, hopefully people on, online can hear me. I guess I'm close enough to the phone that they're probably, they're probably plugging their ears to that. So I'm talking too loud. Um, welcome to Christ our Redeemer Lutheran Church. We're, we're glad you're here with us this morning. Um, as we gather, the word epiphany means a showing forth or a revelation. One of the images associated with our Lord in the session, in the season of epiphany, is that he is the bright morning star. In John's gospel, Jesus, Jesus is quoted as calling out, I've come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. In the season of epiphany, we, we see the brightness of God in the face of, of our Lord. We are called to follow him just as the original disciples are called centuries ago. For all who follow the Lord in humble faith, the future is bright. Please stand with me as we, as we sing the, the opening hymn. Let us now make our confession to our merciful Father in heaven. 
O God, our Holy Father, we admit and confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you in thought and in word and in deed. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We confess that we have not lived lives that are holy and have not shaped all our actions so that they are in accord with your commands. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We confess that your love has not reached up others though through us in every situation. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We confess that we have not always been defenders of the weak and helpless. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. We confess that we have not used every opportunity given, given us to witness to the faith that is ours and have let the devil, the world, and our sinful flesh set the agendas for our lives and actions. Have mercy on us and forgive us, O Lord. The Almighty God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has given you the new birth of water and the Spirit, and has forgiven you all your sins, strengthen you with his grace to life everlasting. Amen. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful, he will surely do that. Amen. O God, o God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. My mouth will tell, will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day, for their number is past my knowledge. With the mighty deeds of the Lord I will come. I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. O God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hair, my God, do not, my, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. Glory, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. O God, be not far from me. O my God, make haste to help me. Thank mm -hmm. Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. Isaiah chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. 
And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? Then I said, Here am I, send me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Psalm is Psalm 138 today. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart, before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give to you, give to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And you, for you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me, my strength of soul you increased. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth, and they shall sing the praise of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly, but the haughty he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the wrath of my enemies, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, it is now, and it will be forever. Amen. And the epistle reading is 1 Corinthians 14, 12 through 20. Since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in building up the church. Therefore, one who speaks in a tongue should pray for the power to interpret. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. What am I to do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will pray with my mind also. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I will sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you are saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, do not be children of your own thinking, in your thinking. Be infants in evil, but in your thinking be mature. This is the word of the Lord. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the fifth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. On one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on Jesus to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake, but the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into the one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put it out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats, so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were, were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. 
From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their nets to the boats to the land, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. of the message this morning is based upon the gospel lesson, the gospel of St. Luke, fifth chapter, which you have just heard read. My dear brothers and sisters of Cole, the exchange of value is the basis of all economic systems. When we go to the store, we get what we need. We are careful to compare quality and quantity with price, especially during these times of inflation. We don't always buy the cheapest brand, for experience has taught us that sometimes the more expensive proves more satisfying or even more economical in the end. For example, we don't always buy the largest loaf of bread even if it is relatively cheaper than the smaller one. Because if we don't have any room in the freezer, 
we know that it will likely go stale before we can use that big little pump. The fundamental rule of our shopping center economics is get your money's worth. Yet occasionally men have apparently defied that rule and have gotten away with it. James J. Hill, about a century ago, bought up stock in the St. Paul and Pacific Railroad. When everyone said that the stock of those railroads were worthless, but he built a railroad empire that came to be known as the Great Northern. William Henry Seward, Secretary of State in the administration of Andrew Jackson, purchased a vast chunk of frigid Russian territory in 1867. Its cost over $7 million, which was a lot of money at that time, especially at a time when the country was trying to pay off the expenses of the Civil War. But what was called Seward's Folly is now our richest state of natural resources. And you know it's Alaska. Bill Gates, as a poor college student, invested everything that he had in a set of paper cards that made a new box in California do nothing more than to display a set of numbers, only two numbers, zero and one in various sequences. But that box is now the personal computer and Gates who developed its operating system called Windows is one of the richest men in the world. Centuries ago, there were four Galilean fishermen who apparently traded everything for nothing and yet came away with an awful lot. Their names were Peter, Andrew, James, and John. The account of their remarkable transaction occurs in the Gospel for the fifth Sunday after Epiphany. The climax of the story is in the final verse. It says, and when they had bought their boats to land, they left everything and followed. The economics of the transaction deserves looking into. What they traded away, what they got in return, and what their acquisition came to be worth later on. It's typical in our economic sophistication that we downgrade occupations with which we are unfamiliar. For example, in the Christmas carol, we sing, the first Noel the angels did say was the certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay. But can anybody sure be sure that these shepherds were poor? If they owned their own herds and flocks, they may have been pretty substantial citizens in that region's economy. The point is that knowing little about shepherds, we take their poverty for granted. We have a similar impression of New Testament fishermen. We often refer to these four men in the gospel as poor Galilean fishermen. Now the Sea of Galilee, or the Lake of Genezareth, was an inland body of water about 14 miles long and 8 miles wide. It is believed that most of those who fished the waters of Galilee cast their nets from the shore, or they hired out as a crew on a pirate, privately owned vessel. But according to our gospel, Simon Peter, presumably with Andrew his brother, owned his own boat. The other vessel in the story belonged to James and John, or their father Zebedee. Our Galilean fishermen had their own nets, mighty valuable equipment in the land that produced little hemp or fiber. They must have uh, owned at least some docking facilities. And it is evident from the story that they had the necessary hardware for stretching, drying, and repairing their nets. 
They may have also owned a cart or two for transporting their catch to the market in the major city of Capernaum. Then too, formal or informal, there was some kind of partnership involving Peter, Andrew, James, and John. Sounds a little bit like Merrill Lynch and Wells Fargo all rolled into one. With this kind of picture, one can only conclude that these enterprising young men in the fishing industry of ancient Galilee had a good thing going. Yet, they traded it all away. Now, before you abandon all of your assets on the beach for the same type of trade, you have to have a good idea of what the deal is calling for. Now, unfortunately, many of us read our Bibles with a certain sense of naivete. We extend the mystical and the miraculous elements of Scripture beyond all reason, arriving at the conclusion that Jesus chanced to come by the waterfront that day, borrowed the deck of Simon's boat to serve as his pulpit, and then, as an expression of appreciation, he provided these local fishermen with the greatest catch they had ever seen. It easily follows that the partners were so impressed that they decided to become his disciples. But it is far more reasonable to suppose that these four men had known Jesus for some months, probably even years. They weren't natives of Galilee. They had grown up in that region. People had listened to Jesus' preaching, knew something of his amazing works, had struggled in their own minds to understand and evaluate his aims, his cause, his measures. Now, if this is to be the case, the effect on these men of the miracle, of the miracle right there on their own fishing ground in proof of their own faith and in an invitation to discipleship right there on their own deck. Well, that would be all the more compelling of a story, wouldn't it be? When Jesus said, henceforth you will be catching men, he must have done so with a confident smile. Long since Jesus probably had noted the courage, the vigor, the integrity, and the faith of these four. He wanted them among his disciples, and this particular day he felt they were ready for the challenges. And on their part, with their eyes wide open, they traded all away the fruits of years of salty labor. But they traded it all in faith. Don't overlook the deeper dimension of their choice. They were sacrificing everything material for something personal. A personal relationship with one who would inspire their admiration, their friendship, and their awesome devotion. We should stop being surprised when people act like this. You see, God made his creatures capable of spiritual understanding when they received knowledge from God. And through this knowledge, which is revealed to us through Scripture, people become vulnerable to the exciting sense of mission. They're able to grasp and fulfill the opportunities that he is offering in his service. In today's Old Testament lesson, Isaiah responded to the divine invitation with, Here am I, send me. And in our epistle, Paul decries the impracticability of speaking in tongues for the value of instructing others in the scriptures. In church, he says, I would rather speak five words with my mind in order to instruct, instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. This is what Christianity is about. 
men and women realizing that the most challenging use of their time and their skills is in the response of love for the cause of Jesus Christ and his message of salvation to the world. This priceless opportunity to realize their impact on the world. This is what the fishermen got in return for abandoning their assets on the beach. The exciting thing about the transactions of James J. Hill, William Henry Seward, and Bill Gates is that one day the whole world would realize what these men got in exchange for what they gave up. People who had gladly, gladly unloaded their worthless stock on Hill later became his paying customers, shipping their goods over the great northern lines. And all controversy over Alaska today centers not on Seward's bargain, but on the best means of utilizing and tapping into the state's resources. And, well, Bill Gates, each and every one of us use the computer every day, whether we know it or not. And I've never heard anyone, not even the disciples themselves, called Peter, Andrew, James, and John for ending up to be apostles instead of fishermen. Indeed, what intrigues me so about this obviously increase in commitment of these men to what they had bought into. No disciple ever returned to his former pursuit. Despite the tragedy of the crucifixion, amazed by the miracle of the resurrection, victimized by years of oppression, of persecution, and even ultimate martyrdom, the fishermen never went back to their nets the sailors never return to the sea. This increasing appreciation for the worth of their choice molded their own lives. Peter, the stirring preacher who won thousands of converts after Pentecost, is a far cry from the Peter who denied his Lord three times. John writing from exile, his mighty gospel of light, is something more than young John, who outran Peter to the tomb, but then was afraid to go after. When men trade away the material for the spiritual, their acquisition not only increases their worth, but of greater significance by far. It increases their worth to their Lord. The discipleship runs even deeper for them. For a generation intent on getting our money's worth, the transaction of these fishermen gives us a lot to think about. But there remains one loose end, one incongruous detail annoying to many minds. If these men were leaving the docks forever, if they would no longer be concerned with boats and tackle and nets and the like, then why the miracle of the great catch of fish? There's something economically absurd about having your greatest bonanza and then quitting business before you even bank the profits. There's just one way it makes any sense, any good sense. Only a catch such as the partners had that day could prove to them how little satisfaction there was in sure economic success. In the Christian scale of values, Prosperity's greatest usefulness is to demonstrate that it cannot satisfy the longing of our souls. Worldly success is the mask of worldly failure until a person discovers that his life and his mission 
in the cause and the love of Jesus Christ. You see, these words are not recorded in Scripture as a call for you to give up everything that you have and go to the seminary. They are to show and to demonstrate the economy of God. No matter what you trade away, including your life, you will always have something far more valuable. No matter what or how much you have, it only has value when you realize that it is less valuable than your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Everything you have is a gift from God. When you set your priorities to see this most precious gift and the faith in the priceless blood of Jesus Christ, then you will know, while it was not hard for them to trade it all away. Amen. Amen. And I'll make the peace of God that passes all understanding. Keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Interesting. Even as you're old as I am, I still learn stuff when I'm when I, <laughs> it, it never occurred to me that they had met him before. It just I always thought it was just he was just some random guy coming along and just picked random people. But they probably knew each other. It was pretty amazing. Please stand as we, we respond to that with confessing our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, in Christ I urge you to lift up your hearts to God and pray with me as Christ our Lord has taught us and truly promised to hear us God our Father in heaven look with mercy on us your needy children on earth and grant us grace that your hope your holy name be hallowed by us and all the world through the pure and pure and true teaching of your word and the fervent love shown forth in our lives Graciously turn from us all false, do false doctrine and evil living, whereby your precious name is blasphemed and profaned. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. May your kingdom come to us and expand. Bring all transgressors and those who are blinded and bound in the, in the devil's kingdom to know Jesus Christ, your Son, by faith that the number of Christians may be increased. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Strengthen us by your Spirit according to your will, both in life and in death, in the midst of good and evil things, that, your, that our own wills may be crucified daily and sacrificed to your good and gracious will. Into your merciful hands we commend we command all who are in need, 
praying for them in, at all times. Thy will be done. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 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 Grant us our daily bread. Preserve us from greed and selfish cares and help us trust in you to provide for all our needs. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 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 Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us so that our hearts may be at peace and may rejoice in a good conscience before you and that no sin may ever frighten or alarm us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. 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 Lead us not into temptation. O Lord, but help us by your Spirit to subdue our flesh, to turn from the world and its ways, and to overcome the devil with all his wiles. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Hear our prayer. And lastly, O Heavenly Father, deliver us from, your, from all evil of both body and soul, now and forever. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Hear our prayer. We trust, O Lord, that your great mercy to we turn. We trust, O Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. There's an offering plate in the back and on the side if you want to worship with your tithes. <laughs> send to us your only begotten Son, and that in him, being found in human form, you did manifest the brightness of your glory, through whom with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and for your great majesty. <laughs> Bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. 
And he gave it to our disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way also, he took the cup after supper. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink it with all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord, Lord Jesus. Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and to drink, you lead us to remember and to confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Peace of the Lord be with you always. Now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, may strengthen you into life everlasting. Go in peace knowing that your sins are forgiven, for you are free. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated as we take a moment to reflect upon this precious gift of grace.
Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for having fed us with the body and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ, assuring us thereby that we are truly members of his body, the Church. And we ask your help, and we ask you to help us by your Holy Spirit, that we may continue in this fellowship and do the good works that you desire us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, to whom you and the same Spirit be all glory, honor, forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. And may the, the Lord look upon you with favor, favor and give you his peace. Amen. Please be seated as we sing. sisters in Christ at Christ our Redeemer. Thank you so much for the Visa gift card which you gave to us as a Christmas gift. We really appreciate your generosity and the expression of care and thanksgiving. We have been blessed by this opportunity to serve you and to get to know all of you. Always anticipating the next time we will be together again. Love, Pastor and, and Dory Dory. Um, this other thing, there's Alabama Child Safety Conference protecting our children and teens. Tuesday, March 1st, there's a, there's a thing. If anybody's interested in, in, in doing that, I'll, I'll leave this set up here. Uh, is there any other announcements? Surely you've got something. <laughs> I have two. Um, first of all, I finished everybody's um, typing statements. You should have already received them in the mail. Um, if you have not seen, did not receive it, 
or you believe it's incorrect, please see me after church. We can make time to sit down and, and go over it, or I can print you a new one. And the other thing is, it's a birthdays, happy birthdays. Um, February's birthdays, we have Jillian McClellan and Bo Paris on February 16th. We have Haley Carr on February 19th. We have Shirley Shiverati on February 24th. Or 80th. <laughs> <laughs> Eric Withrow on February 26th. And Miss Jan Morgan on February 27th. suggestion box was also the shredder. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just set that up. Um, and and uh, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if Linda's on. Listen, thank you very much. She has been doing that job voluntarily for a number of years and, yeah. and really did an excellent job. And, and as a congregation, we we do appreciate what, what she did too. So um, We're still looking forward to her helping us. Yes. Yeah, she, yes. She is, she is my backup and she's also a very big help mm -hmm. she's taken lots of responsibilities she she, yeah, she did an awesome job um, um, is there anything else that anybody has for announcements and if not go in peace and serve the lord thank, thank you, you. Have a wonderful week.